everything we do at every moment of our lives relies on the functions of our brain, be it movement, learning, or communicating. Our complex and amazing brains are controlling it all, from the conscious to the impulsive. And yet much of the time, we take it all for granted. A dizzying flow of millions of diverse elements come together to build and power our brains. But what are these important elements? How are they created and put to work? How do they guide us through the variety of situations we experience each day? And how do they change over time as we change and age? The answer lies in one incredible cell, the neuron. Neurons are unique and sophisticated machines for processing information. There are around a hundred billion neurons in a human brain. Formed in our earliest stages of life, they do not replenish unlike other tissues. This precious resource must last us our whole lives. But a single neuron cannot generate a thought, a memory, or any of the actions that allow us to develop and survive. These functions only emerge when neurons communicate, forming networks. Let's take a closer look at how these fascinating cells actually work. Like all other cells, neurons have a cell body, or soma, and a nucleus, the core of the cell. Beyond that, a neuron is unlike any other cell in the body. Neurons have two distinctive features not seen in other cells, axons and dendrites. These structures are essential for communication, forming the vital neural networks needed for brain function. Neurons are larger and more complicated than any other cell in the body. Most of their volume, 80 to 90% of it, comes from the dendrites and the axons. The dendrites are tree-like structures that receive signals from what can be thousands of other neurons. These signals pass along the dendrite toward the soma, and then onto the axon. Axons are the information superhighways of the brain, long, thin cables that stretch out away from the cell body, seeking other neurons, creating vital connections even at great distances and in completely different parts of the brain. Every process the brain carries out relies on the correct flow of information through these precisely wired networks of neurons. But how do neurons talk to one another? What is the nature of the information that flows through neural networks? And how are these signals generated? Information flows through a neuron in the form of electrical charge and from one neuron to the next via the synapse. While it's not a physical connection, a synapse is a specialized site where axon and dendrite communicate, allowing the flow of information to continue along the axon to the next neuron, and so on through the whole network. These sites are crucial for how the brain stores and processes information. The brain has billions of neurons connected by trillions of synapses. But how do these connections form and how do they change as we age, learn, and remember? To answer these questions, we need to look inside the neuron itself. Proteins are the components of molecular machines present in every cell of every living organism on Earth, the building blocks of life. They shape, manage, and maintain every function a cell performs. Without them, life on Earth simply wouldn't exist. It's not known precisely how many different types of proteins are present in our bodies, 
but current research indicates at least 20,000, and it may be even as many as 400,000. As different types of cells do very different jobs, the proteins present in each cell type differ accordingly. Neurons have the proteins needed for receiving and transmitting information. Given their complex structure and function, the number and diversity of proteins needed by a neuron is enormous. We know in other cells in the body that for every cubic micron of cell, there is about a million proteins. And if we scale that up to a neuron, which is 30,000 cubic microns, we end up with a single neuron having 30 billion proteins. Each one of this staggering number of proteins is created by a process that begins at the very core of a cell. Within the nucleus of cells lies the DNA. This is the instruction manual for making every type of protein that an organism might need. A tiny stretch of DNA containing the instructions for making any specific type of protein is called a gene. But how do we get from gene to protein? The process begins with transcription, which takes place inside the cell's nucleus. Through transcription, the gene sequence that relates to the desired protein is used as a template to make an intermediate type of molecule called messenger RNA, or mRNA. The newly made mRNA carries the protein-making instructions out into the cell body where it connects with a ribosome. In a process called translation, a ribosome travels along the strand of mRNA and reads its message, its instructions from which it can synthesize a completely new protein. The newly synthesized protein is then transported to wherever in the cell it's needed. Protein synthesis takes place in every type of cell in our body. Neurons, however, are bigger than other cells, with great distances between their nucleus and the dendrites and axons. So how do they get the billions of proteins they need to the right place at the right time? There are billions of neurons in the brain, and each neuron can have thousands of synapses, resulting in trillions of connections. For the developing brain, still only in the first trimester, a significant challenge arises when making connections over long distances. How does a developing neuron navigate through the growing, changing human embryo to find exactly the right neuron, sometimes huge distances away? Let's look at the connections between the eye and the brain. The eye connects to the brain via a special type of cell called a retinal ganglion cell which extends axons to many different parts of the brain. We have about a million of these cells. Their axons must accurately connect to targets in the brain that may be as much as tens of centimeters away. This may sound small, but if these cells were the size of a tennis ball, the targets their axons are trying to reach would be nearly two kilometers away. These connections are extremely precise. The axons are tipped with a very specialized growth structure called the growth cone. Here's an axon. Look, you can see its little branch as it comes into the tectum here. It's just got a little bit of a growth cone, hasn't it? And it's starting to back branch. And it constantly puts out uh, finger-like projections that probe the environment to detect cues, signposts in the environment to navigate when they reach the target, the axons then lose the growth cone and begin to form complex arborizations and to form synapses. Having the right proteins present in the growth cone at the right time is crucial for enabling it to read guidance cues and respond. But when the growth cones are so far from the cell body, how do they get the proteins they need to navigate such huge distances? We found that you might not need a huge amount of, of protein to be made, but what you need is you need it on demand, on site, 
to make it in the cell body and transport it along a long axon to the growth cone. That could take over two days. Whereas if you have the mRNA out there, when a signal comes in, translation can happen and boom, you can get copies of protein exactly where you need it. Once neurons have extended their axons to the correct targets, synapses then form. The trillions of synaptic connections formed in the human brain are not chosen at random, but exist between exactly the right types of neurons required for the neural circuits to work properly. Which of these connections are then kept and strengthened, however, relies on a huge amount of trial and error. The embryonic brain forms many more synapses than are needed. When we're born, our senses, while not fully mature, are already working. And these new experiences cause a flood of electrical signals to course through the baby's brain, testing the newly formed synapses, keeping the ones that work, and eliminating those that don't. Trial and error seems an inefficient way to build a brain, but it's vitally important that our brain can be shaped by the world around us, allowing us to learn, remember, and adapt. The ability of neurons to change in this way is called plasticity, and it's essential for brain development when we're young, as well as for learning and forming memories throughout our lives. This process of synapse stabilization and maturation and synapse elimination requires proteins. Neural activity can send a signal to the nucleus of a neuron switching on the production of new proteins by triggering the process of transcription, in turn refining connections and sculpting young neural circuits by stabilizing or eliminating synapses. Sensory experience has a dramatic effect on the development and plasticity of the brain. What experiences are doing is sending a signal in the brain from one neuron to another to turn on programs of gene expression. Those genes get activated by experiences and make proteins that can strengthen or weaken a synapse as needed. It's not just that a signal gets to the brain and the neurons relay the signal. The neurons can undergo profound changes that allow the brain to incorporate new information and retain it, um, in some cases for a lifetime. If there's no environmental input in the life of a child, they won't learn to speak, they won't learn to walk, they won't learn to engage. And so it's this connection that is vital. And when this doesn't occur properly, it results in a number of uh, neurological developmental disorders. The degree of plasticity seen in the very young brain can be dramatic. The elimination and formation of new synapses can be accompanied by the rearrangement of whole dendrites and axons which can completely reconfigure patterns of connections in the brain. However, once the brain has matured, this level of plasticity would be very disruptive. Vital memories and experiences learned when we were young would be at risk of being erased. The mature brain is much more stable than the developing brain. The learning and memory that takes place in the mature brain comes mostly through the changes in the strength of the synapses we already have. As the nervous system matures, we see more of a change in existing synaptic connections and, and probably much less de novo formation and deletion of synapses, but it makes use of existing connections primarily and changes the way that the cells communicate by changing the strength of the synapse. In order for synapses to show long-lasting increases or decreases in synaptic strength, that protein synthesis is also required. Changing the complement of proteins at synapses allows them to change their function. In a single neuron, there are around 10,000 genes expressed at any given time, and around 1,500 of those genes, or 2,000 of them, 
are made into proteins that are really specialized to work at synapses. An average protein at a neuronal synapse has a lifetime of around five days, which means that the cell is constantly making and breaking proteins. And neurons exploit this in order to change the complement of proteins that are present at synapses. An individual neuron can make thousands of synapses with hundreds of different neurons. However, when we learn or form a new memory, only some of these synapses will change, while other synapses on the same neuron will not. For that to happen, there needs to be a way to deliver the proteins for plasticity only to the synapses that need to change. The synapses contain all the machinery needed for making new proteins. The synthesis of a new protein is triggered by the patterns of activity that cause a change in synaptic strength. So as we saw with the growing axons, proteins are also made at synapses, on site and on demand. So if you consider the morphology of the neuron, it houses around 10,000 synapses that are hundreds of microns, we could say miles away from the cell body. If a synapse needs to change quickly and it needs to change itself, but not necessarily its neighbors, it makes a lot of sense to make the proteins locally on demand. This would allow for the activation of a synapse to tell the protein synthesis machinery exactly which proteins need to be made, and then those proteins could be delivered to the synapse that was stimulated. So we need to make sure that the protein synthesizing machines, the ribosomes are present, we need the templates, the messenger RNAs, and we need the synapses to work. And what our work has shown is that the messenger RNAs and the proteins can be delivered and translated or made at remote sites near synapses. Having the ability to synthesize new proteins locally and on demand means that any changes in synaptic strength can be efficient and highly specific. This allows us to retain all the knowledge, functions and skills gained throughout our lives, but also continue to form memories and learn as needed. Neurons are the fundamental building blocks of our brains, assembled into networks, connected by trillions of synapses. Within each individual neuron is a molecular universe consisting of billions of proteins that power and sustain our brains throughout life. Understanding this molecular universe is crucial for understanding how our brains are built, how they work, and how they change as we age, live, and learn.